Alright. So now we're entering into Holy Week. The very reason why Christ came in the first place. Does anybody, Judas, who's cracking the bottle and the eggs? I, I get noise like that. My daughter will contest. Absolutely drive me insane. All right? No clicking of pens. This sound. Nails on a chalkboard to me. So Judas, one of, the, one of the 12 disciples. Maybe you guys are young, you haven't thought. You ever wonder why, why, why would Judas do this? Why would somebody who walked with Jesus for three years... We don't really know what motivated him to betray Jesus. I mean, it's not like this guy had been with him for just a little bit of time. Three years he dedicated his life and followed Jesus around. And then he decides to pull the trigger on betraying Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Even though it was predicted that someone was going to do this in the Old Testament, the fact that Judas did it to me is rather shocking. It's not like he just gave a little bit of his time three years and they were walking around he's made fun of poked, up, poked and prodded by different people his own people laughed at him for doing it and then he just decides for 30 pieces of silver he was going to turn Jesus over we don't know we really don't know what his motivation was unfortunately he played a role in history it was predicted someone was going to do it and unfortunately for Judas it was so there's different ones for Judas' account. Matthew says this. Then one of the twelve said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. I don't know. What we do know about Judas was that he was the keeper of the money. There's several of accounts where he makes comments like, Why would someone why would this woman spend this expensive perfume on Jesus' feet? Why don't we? sell this. We could make money. We could fund our ministry here. He kept the money. There's another hint that he was stealing from the money coffers. So what, he, what was his motivation and why he was one of the 12 disciples? I've heard it postulated or thought out that Judas realized that Jesus enters in on Palm Sunday and then Jesus does nothing. He doesn't take over the mantle. He doesn't assume any earthly power, which they thought he would. And so Judas betrayed him to force Jesus' hand to actually become the king of the Israelites, like, like King David. And he was trying to force Jesus' hand. We don't know. There's no biblical account of that. It's just a guess. Could have been. I don't know. He was racked with guilt with Judas. Another one there, Mark. One of the twelve went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And then he sought an opportunity to betray him. Just kind of stunning for 30 pieces of silver he was willing to do this. Luke gets a little bit more. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was the number of the 12. He went away, conferred with the 12 priests. They agreed to give him money. He consented and sought an opportunity. So here Luke gets a little more that this was Satan that entered him. That just filled him with so much hate that he was going to betray Jesus. We don't know. So, and unfortunately, does anyone remember what happens to Judas? What happens to Judas? What does Judas do? How many people have seen the, the movie The Passion? I'm going to refer to it quite a bit today. Really? That's not good. That's like real no good. All right, now I guess we got more slides. Oh, hey, there we go. So... Nice job, Mr. Drews. I gotta back up now. Oh wow, we went way ahead. So, does anybody know what happened to Judas? What did he do? Any of the kids know? What did Judas do? First, I was asking a question. Who, who saw the Who saw the Passion? Who's seen the Passion? Only a couple people. This is the adults in the room. See fifth through eighth grade. I'm going to refer to it quite a bit. If you really want to see just exactly what's going on 
in a couple weeks what Jesus actually went through for us, you might want to watch it. It is gruesome to watch. It is absolutely gruesome. If, you, if you're not caught looking at that screen realizing, wow, because the pictures that you see of Christ and the cross in churches, it's not even close to the reality of the situation we're talking about today, what Jesus went through, and what crucifixion actually was. But does anybody know about Judas betrays? Then Judas, what did he do? He went and hung himself. Ravaged with guilt, he saw it. I, 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 they don't, we don't know what caused him to hang himself for 30 pieces of silver. Threw the money back and went out and hung himself. So he was so guilty. And then the passion really grabs the fact that cr the loop that Satan entered into him. And then he had these demons. So there's a couple things here. We're talking about the death of Jesus. Yeah, we're still not working up. That is fantastic. Do you have a screen in front of you? Which ones? Oh. Do you have a laptop in front of you? So you no. I'm going to ad lib this. Okay. We'll wait to see if it comes up. So I got to go off memory here. So you got the historic stations of Christ. Oh. <laughs> All right, let's not worry about it. So there's, there's one of the things that is talking about the, the death of Jesus. There's the seven stations of the cross. And then it, is, it was part of the Catholic teachings. And if you watch the movie The Passion, they show the seven stations. And they're, it's very dramatic. And it, you'll be watching going, what does this have to do and there's different stations. And a lot of it, what the Catholic Church did, is they included some historical facts or facts that are found in the Bible, and then they add additional things that have become part of tradition. So part of the Catholic faith is the fact that there's scriptural evidence, and then we take tradition. Things that aren't supported by scripture, but they're traditional. And they're just kind of been passed down. And so these stations of the cross, and we'll get this. All right. I'm going to go as fast as I can. So you got Judas, uh, Jesus is condemned to death. That's one station. Jesus is given his cross. That's shown in the Passion. Jesus falls down for the first time. There's no evidence in the Bible that he fell down, per se. All right? But as he falls down, that scene is there. He meets his mother, Mary. That did happen. Simon of Cyrene helps him carry the cross. That conversation... We don't really know, once again, historical stuff and things have been added. Right here, Veronica wipes Jesus' faith, face, not in the Bible. Jesus falls down for the second time. We don't know this. Jesus meets the woman of Jerusalem. That's in the Bible. Jesus falls down for the third time. Not in the Bible. Jesus is stripped of his clothing. Obviously, he was. Jesus nailed to the cross. Jesus dies on the cross. His body is removed and it's placed in the tomb. But now there are scriptural stations of the cross, legitimate stations of the cross that can be found in the Bible without adding traditional stuff, traditional things. All right? So let's talk about crucifixion. I'm going to be very graphic here so you understand just exactly what's going on here. First of all, Jesus was flayed wide open. This wasn't just whipped a little bit. The Romans, the intention of a crucifixion was to make the person live as long as they possibly could because this was a form of capital punishment and they wanted everybody to see that if you're going to do something against the laws, you're going to steal from somebody or commit murder to deter people from doing this, we're going to have somebody up on a cross and Jesus was on there. Does anybody know how, many, how long Jesus was on the cross? Three days he was on the cross? We got three days on the cross. Was he on, on the cross for three? Three days? He was there for three hours. Your average crucifixion, you'd be on there for a day, two, maybe three days. So your answer is right. And it's significant. We'll get to it. Why did Jesus only last three hours? But you'd be up there a long time. The goal of crucifixion was they'd whip you first. So now just imagine you're, you're ripped wide open. It's not just whipped cat of nine tails it was a flayed barbs dug into your skin and then they pulled it and they ripped your skin open and they did it on both sides and then they'd nail you to the cross and you all see jesus the, the the nails in the hands it was more than likely in the wrist in the roman thinking the, uh, the hand consisted from the elbow up so they went right through the wrist to catch you right on that bone 
So you hung there. You couldn't go anywhere. If it was on your hand, it would just rip right up, right? The nail would just pull right out and you'd just rip your hand. They put it right here, so you just notched in on your arms. And they'd miss the artery, and there you'd be. So more than likely it'd be here. So yes, the Bible says, look at my hands, but we're thinking this is our hand hand. But their thinking back then was everything from the elbow up to the hand was considered the hand. So he would just pick there. Then the feet, the little thing was pressed like this. So they'd nail your feet together or tie your feet. So the goal was you you basically would be suffocating yourself to death as your lungs filled up with fluid. So then you had to be like this. You had to use your feet to lift yourself up to get the pressure off your diaphragm so you could breathe. And it was a constant up, down, up, down to relieve that pressure because you wanted to breathe. Because the body's natural instinct, if someone's on top of you and is laying on top of you and you can't breathe, what's your reaction? Do you not panic a little bit because I can't breathe? So there's a struggle. So it's the same thing if you're like this and I can't breathe. It's going to be a natural human instinct to react to that and go up there. Meanwhile, your back is wide open, ripped open, and you're scraping your back on a wood cross back and forth as splinters are digging into your back. Over hour after hour after hour after hour. It's a significant, unbelievable way. The Romans did not create crucifixion. The Persians, it had been going on for a long time. The Romans just perfected the art. They perfected the art of making this something that lasted a long period of time. The Persians did it. It didn't last as long. The Romans, they were sadistic. They wanted to make it last as long as they could, and they put it right out for everybody to see, right on main roads, and you'd walk by, and there was a criminal standing there screaming in agony. And then what they do with the body? They let it sit on the cross and let animals eat the body. This is what's going on. This is how human beings treated each other back then, and this was commonplace. This was normal. They did this over and over and over again. And Jesus Christ knew this was going to happen to him, and Jesus Christ did this. Now I'm going to skip ahead. Why did I say he only lasted three hours? There's something significant. Jesus did not die from the agony that he was incurring. Jesus Christ could have taken a lot more. He could have lasted a lot longer. He decided on his own free will to give up his life and surrender his, his spirit and die for our sake. He willingly gave up his life. So it only lasted three hours. He covered for the payment of sin in that three hours. We're going to see he says it is finished, and then he gives up his spirit. He did not die in, because, oh my goodness, I can't take this anymore. I don't want to do it. The suffering that I've gone, the fact that my back is ripped wide open, the front of my chest is ripped open from the cat and nine tails, my legs, my groin, my butt, my feet, my hands, my head ripped wide open, and now I'm nailed. That is not, that's not what killed me. I, of my own free will, give up my life. That's what the cost of our sins cost Jesus Christ. And that's why the cross is in the front of every church. And I don't think it would look very pretty if we actually had an image on the cross of what Jesus actually probably looked like. I remember when I saw the Passion for the first time with my wife, she said, it's not like that. I said, it's very clear. Isaiah 53 is very clear. That he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted by man, and he was striped for our transgressions. He was striped, ripped, ripped open. Yeah, that's exactly how it was. And he took it. So now there's some scriptural stations of the cross. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about the crucifixion. It's not a cozy little thing to think about. It's something that you got to be careful with in little younger ones. And if you're going to watch the Passion, when you actually see the whipping of Jesus, it is a very difficult thing to watch. It's very difficult to watch. I will, I will admit, there's many times in my family we have fast forward to it. Because it's, it's, it's a bloody scene. And, but it's, that's what it was. Jesus in the garden. He goes to the garden. He wants to go pray. He takes his three disciples with him. And they fall asleep. Guys, just stay awake. I'm, I'm struggling here. You're my friends. He's starting to see. Jesus didn't just die. He didn't just get whipped and beaten. His friends leave him. His disciples can't even stay awake. They're falling asleep. They can tell he's struggling with something. He just wants some companionship and his friends. They ditch him. They can't even stay away from him. They run. As soon as he starts getting persecuted, they just run, hide, because they're afraid. Because why do you think they ran? I think all of us would probably run. Do you want to be whipped like him? 
I, have you seen that? No way would I, want, I would want that. That'd be unbelievable pain. So they just want them to stay up. They don't. They fall asleep. Jesus is betrayed in the garden. Judas comes in. He finds him. Judas betrays him. Brings over him. Kisses him. Amelia, he says, Rabboni, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. Now we're going to find out. Oh, this one? What? Okay, we're going to go back here. Jesus betrayed. It's not on here. Peter then reacts to this in the garden. Does anyone remember what Peter did? Yeah, he grabbed he grabbed his sword. They all had like a little a little dagger. And you think, well, what's going on? Yeah, they had swords. They, they, even the disciples had it. I mean, they were walking dangerous areas. They also needed to cut things, cut up meat, cut things, but they also to protect for protection. And so Peter pulls it out there, cuts off the high priest, one of his one of the servants, cuts his ear off. Some say cut his ears off. Another one he actually identifies his name. Does anyone remember his name? Any adults remember his name was? No? No? Malchus. Malchus. Cut off Malchus' ears. So he, he actually identifies. It's interesting. I can I can give you I can tell you one thing. When the Bible gives someone actual name and it doesn't just say it was a servant, but it actually identifies that person. Early Christians reading the, the scripture, they're saying you can actually go and talk, physically talk to Malchus. He'll tell you this story. Luke is the one who says his name. Luke is a historical writer that interviewed people, and he identifies people by name. And there's another one later that we're going to run into. Jesus is condemned by the Sanhedrin. We won't get into the real specifics here, but this is the thing about it. You couldn't just make up accusations against someone. Nowadays, we got a court of law. You need proof. If it's just Ambrose and I, and Ambrose said I did this, and I say I didn't do it, there's no other witnesses. There's no way to prove I'm right. There's no way for Ambrose to prove. But if Ambrose has witnesses that I actually did it, now he can bring witnesses. It's the same thing that's happening here at the Sanhedrin. If Jesus said this, bring witnesses. It was Jewish law set down by God through Moses. You've got you to gotta have two or three people got to accuse me. And he's escorted in there, and, they, and one person just says, well, this is what I saw. And then another person comes, this is what I saw. And Jesus knows, you can't do this. You guys are breaking the law of Moses. The, 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 the Sanhedrin. Does anyone know what the Sanhedrin is? Who is the Sanhedrin? Does anybody know? The what? No, actually not. The Sanhedrin was the ruling body. It would be like our court system. It'd be like uh, it's the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the two groups of the Jewish people, the leaders, the scribes. They had a big conference. They had a big uh, group of people, and they called themselves the Sanhedrin. They voted on things. And so he's in front of all the chief priests. He says they're chief priests and scribes, the Sanhedrin. The of you are the Christ tell us. What further testimony do we really need? He says he's the Son of God. Blasphemy. So now they have no right. Then Jesus denies Peter. Here's the thing about the Sanhedrin. This is where we're going to run in. They did not have the power to put someone to death. They didn't have any power. This is what's going on here. It's a power play. Jesus is right in the middle of a power play. you got the Romans. They're the only ones that can put someone to death. The Sanhedrin finds Jesus guilty, but they can't put him to death. So they're going to have to have the Romans do it. And the Sanhedrin and the chief priests, they make a deal with the Romans. And we're going to find out what this is. So Jesus is caught in the middle of a political intrigue here. So Jesus is denied by Peter. Peter said, I'll never deny you. Three times denies who he is. Because why do you think Peter did it? I don't want to look like Jesus. Because I know what's coming down the road. So he doesn't want to do it. And it's also there for us. And who do you think probably told the story that he denied? Peter himself probably told the story to Matthew and to Luke and everybody. Right now it's just Jesus and Peter. Doesn't say any other disciples are there. Peter probably very delicately had to tell his friends, yeah, I denied him three times. I denied who Jesus was. He was my friend. He was one of my closest. He was one of the big three. He was one of the top three. Denies Jesus. Jesus is judged by Pontius Pilate. See, now the Sanhedrin, they can't put him to the death, so they're going to go to Pontius Pilate. And we're going to start to see, if you don't put Jesus to death, the Sanhedrin tells Pontius Pilate, in no small little terms, we're going to riot. And if we riot again, 
you're going to be in trouble by the emperor. Because the Jewish people had constantly rebelled against Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate had poked the bear. We don't know about this in the Bible. We know from Josephus that Pilate went in prior to all of this. And he goes through the temple with donkeys and pagan stuff. And he desecrates the temple. Irritating the Jewish people and they revolt. He puts 27 of their people to death on a little riot. The Jewish people riot again. The emperor says, one more time, Pontius Pilate, and you're done. You're going to come back to Rome, and guess what's going to happen to Pontius Pilate? I'm going to kill you. I'm the emperor. I'm going to put you to death because you can't handle running an empire. You can't handle being my person there. So now the Sanhedrin knows this. And if you don't put him up, we're going to riot, and you're going to have to go back to Rome, and you're going to be dead. Jesus is literally caught right in the middle of a political intrigue. And what is Pilate going to do? I want to keep my power. I want to keep who I am. And now the Sanhedrin comes up. And what do I, it's Jesus. I find no guilt in this guy. He didn't do anything. He doesn't deserve to die, but I'm washing my hands. It's your fault. Even though Pontius Pilate skipped his, his role in history. We rise, we say, that, we say his name in the Nicene and the Apostles' Creed. Pontius Pilate is now infamous because he didn't stand up for what was right. He stood there because he wanted his power instead of doing what was right. He, he put an innocent man to death, and he had the power to stop it, and he didn't do anything about it. And here we are in 2024, and Pontius Pilate, we say right in the Apostles' Creed, a man of infamy. All he had to do was just do the right thing. But he wanted power on the earthly power. Pontius Pilate, Jesus is scourged at the pillar and crowned with thorns. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. That word is very more, it's very more specific in the Greek. He was ripped open. It's not just this gentle flogging that you might see in some movies. Hit with a stick or some reeds. There probably was. He was flogged. He was stripped. He was ripped open. He was flayed open. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arraigned him in a purple robe to make fun of him. Purple is the thing of royalty. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him him with their hands. I mean, they just add it on top of the other. And if you watch the Passion, they're, they're literally drinking while they're doing this. And they just are filled with rage and hatred and mocking. The one guy has this unbelievable, disturbing laugh as he's doing it. He thinks it's funny that this is happening to Jesus, that they're ripping him up. They're just sweating. The guys can barely breathe in the movie The Passion because of the number of times they hit him. They have to take a break and put their hands down because they're exhausted from they just keep whacking him and whacking him and whacking him. This wasn't, this was not an easy picture. And then he bears the cross, and they make him here now carry your cross. After we do that to you, now you gotta walk from the inside of Jerusalem, and you gotta walk outside the gates, up a hill, and you gotta take your own cross. Some show the whole cross, remember that thing when it's the whole cross? Some say you just carried the beam, just the top beam, not the whole cross, that the actual post was in the ground, and the other, and that you had to carry just a cross beam. We don't know whether it was the whole cross or just a beam. We don't know either or. They said, away with him, crucify him. We'll have no king but Caesar, which is a joke, by the way. Does anybody know why that's a joke? That's a, that's a bold-faced lie. The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. That's a bold-faced lie. And Pontius Pilate knew this. Does anyone know why? Who's the only king? According to the Jews, who's the only person that's a king to the Jewish people, not Christians, to the Jews? Who was it? Hmm? Someone said it. God. They had no king. That's a bold-faced lie. But they're just saying this? Why would they say that? Because guess what, Pilate? Yeah, we're Caesar. Good job. That's a lie. We have no king but Caesar. They're just lying through their teeth right now. So they took Jesus and they went out bearing his own cross to the place called the skull, the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Or Golgotha, some say. Jesus helped by Simon the Cyrene to carry the cross. And they compelled the passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Notice this mark identifies two sons of Simon of Cyrene. And in Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 16, Paul says, give my regards to Alexander and Rufus. Paul even mentions Alexander and Rufus after this whole thing, the two sons. We don't know for certain, but i got to believe that that's, Paul is saying Alexander and Rufus, they became believers. 
and Simon of Cyrene, their dad, they saw, I saw my dad carry Jesus Christ's cross. And Paul wishes him luck. 30 years, 30, 40 years after the crucifixion, Paul's writing a letter talking about Alexander and Rufus. Two times they're actually mentioned in the Bible. Jesus meets the woman of Jerusalem. By turning to them, Jesus says, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. They will, then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Weep the children of Israel to the Jewish people. Non-believers, you're going there. Weep. Days are coming when blessed. You don't have children. You don't have to worry about this. Jesus is crucified. Come to the place of the skull, and they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And then we're going to run through the stations of the cross. They divide up his garments. We're going to skip through this a little bit. We're going to run out of time. I'm going to skip through this because I want to get to this. Does anyone know the seven last words of Jesus? We're going to, I'm going to highlight one specific. Does anybody know some of the last words? And no, it's not, I hurt. That was one of the things the kids said in my confirmation class. I hurt. What, just, you know any of them? It is finished? Yep. My God, my God, why, has you, why have you forsaken me? The Son of God, triune God, I've said this before to this group, how can one person be three and one, one and three? The triune God is accepted totally by faith. We're one person, I'm not three people, indis distinct, separate things, but yet one. That's a difficult concept, that's one accepted by faith. So here's the Son of God, He's one with the Father, and he doesn't feel God's presence. Kind of gives you, I'll tell you one, tell you, why is God not there? He'll have absolutely nothing to do with sin. That's the whole part of this whole thing that's been going on since the beginning of creation. He'll have nothing to do with it. He doesn't, he doesn't approve of it. He doesn't like it. He'll have nothing to do with it. And his son was carrying the sins of the whole world, of anybody that ever had sinned, all sin that's being committed right now and will forever be committed, all at the same time, all taken, and God will have nothing to do with Jesus on the cross. I will have nothing to do with him. And so he didn't feel God's presence. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Anybody else? Does anybody else know? Some of the other ones? There's seven of them. We just got two. Let's go through them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I just was ripped wide open. I'm hanging on the cross. I'm going to sit here and suffer. I got nails through my hands. I got through my feet. I'm struggling for my very life. Forgive them. Jesus says, even forgive your enemies. Be like Christ. Christ is on the cross, and he's, he does it. Unbelievable. Truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's what he says to the thief on the cross. You're going to be with me in paradise. Does someone have to go through all the things that we go through and everything? He says, no. The thief, you identified who I was, you said who I was, and today you're going to be with me in paradise. I'm going to be dead, and so are you, and you're going to be with me. Woman, behold your son, and then behold your mother. This was said to John and his mom, Jesus' mom. John was the only disciple standing right at the foot of the cross. Behold your son. And behold your mother. He passes off his mother. Out of love, out of concern for his mom, who's going to take care of my mom now, I'm passing it on to the disciple John. Showing love and compassion for his mother and honoring who his father and mother are while he's suffering. Another unbelievable statement. And then I thirst. Shows that he was human. I'm thirsty. I'm suffering. I'm in pain, but I thirst. I have human needs just like any anybody else. He's true God and true man. This shows that he was a true man. I thirst. If he was just a God, he wouldn't have been thirsty. So he says, I thirst. That's marked down so we know. He was man and God. And then we already got that one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Anyone know what the actual Aramaic is for that? Remember what it is? Eloi, Eloi, Lama Saga, Sabachthani. That will be said on, on Good Friday. And then it is finished. That's the one I want to focus on. John 18, this is what it said. After he had said this, he went back out. Oh, sorry. 
the death of Jesus. After this, Jesus, knowing all that was to be now finished, said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Keep in mind, he's, he's struggling right now. He wants to be able to drink a little something, and they give him sour wine. They're not giving him water. His, water is, his lungs are filling up with water. That's why you see the spear. They pierce his side, and clear liquid comes pouring out. That was a sign that he had. it was done. He didn't react when the spear was poked in him, and then just pure, not blood, but just pure water poured out because they got him from the side, and they pierced his lung, and the lung just collapses, and it was a, just pure liquid pours out. When, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Matthew said he uttered a loud cry. Mark says he uttered a loud cry. They weren't at the foot of the cross. John is at the foot of the cross, and he says, no, Jesus says it is finished. How do you think Jesus said it is finished? When you see this red, do you think he said it's, fin that you, like, it's finished? Would you agree? Have you ever, ever thought of that? When he was standing there and everything he went through, do you think he just said it is finished? How do you think he said it? What inflection do you think he said? To the adults in the room, is it most, you just say he just like, like, thank God it's over. Thank you, God, it's over. It's finished. Have you ever thought about that? Just, you know, it's finished. Matthew says he uttered a loud cry. Mark says he uttered a loud cry. Luke says he uttered a loud cry. John says not just that he uttered a loud cry, but he says it is finished. The, that in the Greek, it is finished is one word in Greek. It's called tetelestai. And that word was used in Greek thinking when there was a debt owed. And if, somebody, if I owed somebody a debt and I paid that debt off, I would go to the person, they'd mark a legal account of it, they'd put a stamp on it, and it said, Testelestai. It is finished. And it was uttered in triumph. It was not uttered in defeat. It was not uttered in, I'm just, oh, I'm doing this. This was a loud cry. He uttered, it is finished. Testelestai. I just paid for everybody's sins. Everyone that ever lived, is currently living, and will ever live. I just defeated death, and now I'm going to willingly give up my life. I'm, I'm not suffering here like I can't take this anymore in my body. And the fact that they ripped me open is not what killed me. I'm going to surrender my life of my own free will. And I'm going to do it in three hours. And I'm just going to give it up freely. So the question that I have, and you're going to have when you go to your small groups, the main question is. And this is the main question of Christianity. And this is why this Holy Week and what you're going to go through. And you're going to see if you come to church. And you're going through is the question of this. What's my response to the fact that someone did this for me? That's the ultimate goal of why you come to this, Ignite. It's the ultimate goal why you come to church. It's your ultimate goal. What's my response to what I owe Jesus Christ for what he did for me? Is it just casual attendance? Casual paying attention? Casual obedience to what he's saying? Even though I know, realize, and you watch the passion, that someone was ripped open with a cat of nine tails because of my sins? And if it's my sins that caused this, does it not require something of me? If he's willing to give up his life and do all of this, there's something that has to be required of me. There's something to be. What's my response? That's the ultimate thing. That's been God's plan from the beginning in the, the Ten Commandments. I'm the one who del delivered you out of the land of Egypt. I'm the one who parted the Red Sea. I'm the one who delivered the Ten Plagues. I'm the one who did the Passover. Now acknowledge who I am. Now with Jesus Christ, I'm the one that hung on the cross. I did all of that. That's why you're here. That's why you're at Ignite. Somebody did this for me. I watched the Passion. With, I watched one scene with my dad, and he stood there, Lutheran pastor, for a long time. I can't believe someone would do that for me. I can't believe someone would hang on the cross and deal with that kind of pain. I just can't imagine it. Because I should be the one on there. But he took it for me, and that's the, what's my response to that action? It's a significant question. And in your small group, spend some time. What is my response? So that's what God is asking. And if we just think it was just a casual little thing, and he was whipped just a little bit, this was a significant beating. He was absolutely crushed because of what we've caused to bring on this world. And so what's my response? And the good news is, he says, you know what? I did this for you. And that's the good news. I did this for you. I did this to free you. I did this because I love you. We're all brothers and sisters of God. Jesus Christ calls us all brothers and sisters. 
I've said this before, and I know there's a couple sixth graders in here that hear me in class. All the women in this group, every woman, should be literally saying thank you, Jesus Christ, because he liberated the way women were treated. Absolutely liberated the way they were treated. You can read enough history of the way women were treated back then. It was terrible. And I'm not saying it's been easy. I'm not saying men haven't done a bad job because, what, women have had the right to vote for, what, like 100 years or something like that? I mean, but that's not God's fault. That's man's fault. But Jesus Christ gave value to women. He went to the woman in the well. He freed the woman of the demons. No one else cared. Someone was a widow. Then what are they going to do? I've said this to sixth graders. If a woman lost her if she lost her husband, right now, if someone loses their spouse and you've got a couple children, can the wife go work? Can the wife find a job? Does anybody in here think that that's bad that a woman does this? Back in Jesus' time, there was no work for the woman. They worked in the house. They took care of the children. You didn't work. So what was a woman going to do if she lost her spouse and no other man would marry her? Because now, quote unquote, she's damaged goods because she's got kids. I don't want her. Husband says, I'm just going to divorce you. And they were the Jewish people, just, oh yeah, I'll just divorce you. You didn't make my food right. What were they going to do? Yeah, Thomas knows this. Bag on the streets or what else? Even worse. Temple, they'd have more than like let them turn to prostitutes. How are you going to take care of my children? This is what was happening to women. Jesus Christ liberated women. Absolutely liberated. Christianity did that. And you can see it in the early church. Yeah, it's the gospel story. It's what Jesus has done for all of us. It's significant. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable story that someone did this for us was willing to do it and take our sins and cover it up there and free us from the struggle that we find ourselves in. That's all I have. Enjoy the questions.